Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I, somebody said, you can't see anything from up here. So I, I can't see anything from up here. It says spotlight. Interesting place to be. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have some uh, fun here and look at some different things dealing with uh, different aspects of post-contact technology advancements. And here's, here's my little title here, uh, ET Contact, Implications for Post-Contact Advancements in Science and Technology. So with that, uh, excuse me for the mic, uh, we will start here. Uh, this, uh, actually all of us speakers, which nobody has mentioned to this point, all of us speakers uh, wrote a paper uh, for this conference. Uh, and the papers, this is what mine is, mine looks like, the, just the abstract, I'll read it to you. You can get it somewhere, uh, someday. I don't know where they are uh, so far as the black hole, but I think they're going to emerge and everybody, you'll get uh, availability of those things. Let me start off right off at the very beginning. Uh, in the introduction section here and say, without, uh, without argument, intelligent beings from other star systems have been and are visiting our planet Earth. They are visiting Earth now. Anybody with an IQ over room temperature <laughs> who does a little bit of homework comes to that conclusion. It doesn't take much. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. This is not a matter of conjecture or wishful thinking. Now, so that's said. We will use the term, I will use the term ET, extraterrestrial, in this discussion, indicating that the beings that we're dealing with, communicating with, learning from, are not generally from Earth. One could go into other arguments that they've been here for a long time, underground, and all that sort of thing. I'm just going to use that as a general term, and I think all of us are familiar with that term. Uh, from the movie on. The second uh, definition I want to define for you is the concept of uh, disclosure. I was involved uh, heavily in the disclosure project, which kind of really uh, set the stage for this back in the uh, early 2000s uh, in Washington, D.C. I co-wrote the briefing document uh, with Dr. Greer on this thing, which is still almost a 500-page document you can get uh, from our the disclosure project website. Uh, early on, we heard a talk about after disclosure, AD. I'm going to term, define the term open disclosure, and I mean that the following. Governments of the world and the media totally accept and publicly discuss the reality of ETs visiting our planet in an honest and open manner with the public. This has not happened yet, as we all know. Uh, particularly when anybody, uh, there are uh, the media, members of the media who will talk about a sighting or something going on, and they always either preface it with little green men or go snicker, snicker, and green cheese at the end of the year. We've all seen that on everything from CNN, to ABC, to NBC, etc. So until they totally accept and publicly discuss the reality, open disclosure has not occurred. So what I'm going to be talking about in this talk is the concept of where we go once open disclosure occurs. There will be dramatic and rapid changes in many areas of human endeavors on this planet. These changes will result from the sharing of information by and from the ETs, as well as the release of knowledge gained by covert human project. Linda just gave us a perfect example of a covert project dealing with ET uh, and, and t knowledge and technology. The speed of these changes, and I'll get more into the changes as we go on, will depend on at least four factors. And I'll come back to the end of the, at the end of the talk on these four factors. One, the willingness of the ETs to share knowledge in the rate at which they share. They will determine how much they tell us and at what speed they tell us, uh, basically for our own good, I believe. Second of all, the willingness of human covert groups to share what they have already learned and have kept suppressed for many, 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 many decades. Uh, we've talked about that earlier in some of the talks. Finally, uh, sec uh, thirdly, uh, the acceptance of contactee reports on what they've observed and what they were told. We heard uh, Jim Sparks talk last night, uh, which is excellent, informative, very interesting, and yet many uh, contactees like himself who talk about this are poo-pooed in the uh, media and the, and the press and government 
spokespersons. Finally, uh, finally, uh, the issue in terms of the speed of changes will depend upon the, depend upon the rate at which entrenched human organizations, and boy, they are entrenched, and governments incorporate this new information into human society, and of course, how human society responds to this new information. So, although I can tell you today, or the and CNN can talk about today, here it is, this is what's happening, it's gonna take a while for these changes to be uh, accepted. We can expect there will be major resistance to any changes, especially from the global money sectors and the control groups who keep this under wraps. This because they do not want to change the present paradigm, which is basically uh, raping the earth uh, for all of its uh, information, uh, natural resources, what have you. Any of the many technologies potentially available will be considered disruptive technologies. And disruptive technologies are those uh, which are transformational. Here's a little history of... Disruptive technology, a little uh, list I put together in three categories, warfare, transportation, and energy sources. The colored ones at the bottom are those that are sort of in the future, now and in the future. The others are fine. So we start out with just example with warfare. Everybody started out with warfare using fists and rocks initially, and then we went to spears and arrows, and then we got uh, gunpowder and guns, and, and of course that expend, extended to planes. And then once we had planes, we could then drop bombs and bigger bangs and atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, nuclear bombs, rockets, different ways of delivery. So warfare has really gotten uh, pretty efficient uh, these days as uh, some of the other speakers have referred to humans killing other humans. Uh, potential uh, transformative technologies include psychotronics, use of uh, psychological uh, and um, mental capabilities uh, weather modifications, that's going on now, it appears. Uh, scalar use of scalar wave technology for weather mods and, and uh, affecting human minds, etc. Human transport, uh, transportation started out with our basic feet. They still work. And uh, a bee of bees, bee of bees, beasts of burden, okay? Different societies have used uh, beasts of burden, horses, etc. And we go on up to airplanes and uh, anti-gravity. We've talked about that, teleportation, stargates. We'll see. Uh, energy sources, uh, we start out with basic sunlight for energy and uh, snuggling at night, and uh, then move on into uh, a wood fire and on up into uh, a zero point energy, radiant energy, anti-gravity technology, which uh, folds into the energy technology. So that's, those are transformative technologies and something that the present control uh, paradigm uh, does not want to see. Uh, they want to release things at their own time, their own time scale. Now, uh, all truth passes through three phases, uh, noted by uh, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer back in the early 1800s. First, truth is ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. Third, it's accepted as self-evident. And uh, we, we see that uh, we're, we're somewhere in the beginning there, as you can see. Uh, Arthur Clarke, a great science fiction writer, uh, a science inventor actually, invented a lot of things through his science fiction, uh, rephrase this as uh, things are anything development of uh, revolutionary nature. It's either initially nonsense or it's not important. Uh, I think uh, John Alexander's comment was that UFOs were not important at the very end last uh, yesterday. Um, I always thought it was a good idea, said it was a good idea, and finally I thought of it first. And we see this in the scientific establishment uh, today. Uh, Richard uh, Rich gave a very uh, excellent talk on the history of things, and it's a good review of the after-disclosure issues. Uh, what he's really referring to there, it's by the title of the book, is Open Disclosure, uh, and it's a, it's a good book. Um, so that's the introduction. We've done with that. Uh, what I'm going to do now is review uh, some scientific and technology areas uh, dealing with transportation, energy production, communication technologies, a, a bit of cosmology and consciousness issues at the very end, and a couple comments about the medical sciences, and finally, uh, the conclusions. Okay, uh, transportation issues. Uh, well, how do they get here? 
And uh, since they are here, this means they've done two things. They've one, they've solved the technology to bypass the speed of light and probably time, as we've heard in several converse, uh, conversations over the last day or so. Uh, those limitations expressed by current academic physics, physicists and physics, and have two, determined how to access energy to do so. They are not using, as somebody else noted yesterday, they are not using Exxon jet fuel to go from star system to star system. Uh, if they can do this, why can't we? Have the physicists been keeping something from us? Is 20th century physics uh, missing some points? Or have they been keeping it from us? So the first thing people really should ask once they accept the fact that they are here is the following. How do they get here? And once again, if they can do this, uh, why can't we? Very important question. Uh, a bit of history, uh, I will go through a couple things that uh, Paul mentioned yesterday, uh, just because they're in the talk here. Uh, T. Townsend Brown's uh, uh, initial findings back in the late 20s on the, what became known as the Beefield Brown effect of uh, high charged uh, dielectric capacitor, uh, high K dielectrics, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of volts put in it, produce a force in one direction. And Paul explained that in kind of a major detail yesterday. Uh, T. Townsend Brown did the experiments in Hawaii with the flying disc that uh, he showed pictures of yesterday in the early 1950s. Uh, this is from uh, Paul's book, actually, or one of his earlier books. Um, interestingly enough, uh, back in 2002, at the uh, request of the head of the Space Colonization Technical Committee of the AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, asked me to put together a paper for them, and I titled the paper, Outside the Box, Space and Terrestrial Technologies of Transportation and Energy Technology of the 21st Century. I can never remember that title. I should have done better in the title. Uh, but it's a rather interesting paper in which I looked at some of the earlier stuff that other people have talked about uh, at this conference. And uh, the paper is now available at the Disclosure Project. It's been reprodu reproduced in a number of different books, and it's available on a number of different websites. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, a more recent paper that sort of updates what I said uh, is uh, Tom Vallone's work. Uh, he's a, uh, Dr. Vallone's a scientist, Integrity Research Institute, and he's been very active in uh, pursuing uh, what's going on in the areas, as you see underlined there, electrogravitics, electrogravity, uh, and the analysis of electrokinetics. Uh, he reviewed some of the uh, journals that uh, Paul mentioned yesterday, the aviation studies uh, reports on electrogravitic systems and the gravitic situation. Uh, a good review uh, following my review. And then, of course, we have Paul's book on secrets of anti-gravity propulsion, if you want the whole story. And we heard him talk yesterday. And there's a younger Paul standing beside lots of uh, radio telescopes. He was also one of the Disclosure Project witnesses, and uh, there are several of them here as well. Now, a, a bit history in terms of transportation. And I'm, I'm going to go through some of this because it leads into what the Disclosure Project witnesses had said because this is one of those technologies that is, ETs have it, but we also have it, and I want to sort of make this point. Uh, disclosure on this issue, uh, Herman uh, Overth uh, in 1954 stated, it is my thesis that flying saucers are real and that they are spaceships from another solar system. This was one of the fathers of the space age, worked with Werner Brumbrand. Uh, he also goes on to say, I think that they possibly are manned by intelligent observers, members of race that may be investigating our Earth for centuries. Well, that makes sense from what we've heard today. They are possibly sent out to conduct systematic, long-range investigations of men, animals, vegetation. <laughs> Hello? OK. Uh, uh, anyway, he continues on. And it's very interesting, that the further down the line what he says, 
They are flying by the means of artificial fields of gravity. They produce high tension electric charges in order to push air out of their paths so it does not start glowing and strong magnetic fields to influence the ionized air at higher altitudes. This would explain their luminosity, reported by many, many sightings, and of course the noiseless UFO flight. Now he is picking up on what T. Townsend Brown had said. Uh, Paul mentioned this yesterday, the aviation studies. Uh, I won't detail this, I'll just read the first bit there. Electrostatic energy, this is in 1956 by the way, uh, British research company in the aviation studies report. Electrostatic energy sufficient to produce a Mach 3 fighter is possible with megavolt energies in a K of over 10,000. They noted, and this is important noting, one of the difficulties in 54 and 55 was to get aviation to take electrogravitics seriously. The name alone was enough to put people off. In other words, by the early 50s, the word was out that you don't do research on anti-gravity, when in reality, all of these companies listed there at the bottom and more were frantically doing research on anti-gravity. So the stage is already set to poo-poo this sort of stuff. In the early 2000s, I was, uh, I was in contact with people inside Boeing, uh, and uh, Boeing Fanworks and Eugene Pokletnoff uh, in terms of the anti-gravity stuff. And we were going to work with Pokletnoff and doing some anti-gravity things. And we were setting this up with, uh, with Boeing. Uh, and over the weekend, I met with some of the Boeing people on a Friday. Over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal, or one of the papers in New York, ran an article saying, Boeing is doing research on anti-gravity. Ha, 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 isn't that funny? Why don't they build airplanes? That was it. Nothing went any further. I was called up on Monday and said, we can't go forward with this. The disclosure uh, project in uh, early <clears throat> in 2001 uh, produced a book out of that with uh, multiple witnesses, nearly 70 witnesses in there, many of them talking about the existence of electrogravitic and zero-point technologies. And I want to go through a couple of these witnesses because they fit into the pattern of what we've seen. Uh, Master Sergeant Dan Morris, uh, who has died, uh, he was actually Daniel Morris Salter, uh, was an NRO operative, et cetera. Uh, Master Sergeant involved in extraterrestrial projects for many years. He was recruited at the NRO and had cosmic top secret clearance. He stated at the disclosure project, to the disclosure project, UFOs are both extraterrestrial and man-made. We all know that. And uh, he mentions T. Townsend Brown as one of our guys who was almost up with the Germans. And so we had to keep him and doing anti-gravity research propulsion secret. He also mentions an energy device there below, and this is uh, dealing with the energy technologies using zero-point energy. Well, if you have one of these units that's about oh, 16 inches long and about 8 inches high, 10 inches wide, you don't need to plug into the electric, local electric company. These devices burn nothing. No pollution, never wears out because there are no moving parts. Uh, uh, a... Uh, a gentleman who works uh, at Boeing still, which is why I, he may have retired by now, I don't know. Uh, but he stated to us, uh, that's why it's just initials. Most aircraft work, uh, operate, most of the craft, referring to UFOs, operate anti-gravity, electrogravitic propulsion, uh, Area 51 with Northrop. We're flying anti-gravity vehicles up there in Utah. Uh, a, a Dr. B, uh, also involved in anti-gravity research for many, many years in covert projects, top secret projects, stated uh, they have a big think tank up at Hughes, big anti-gravity projects, I used to talk to them. The key point I wanted to make is here, but the American public will never, never hear about this. So the people inside were saying, you know, we're having fun with this, but forget it for telling the people uh, who need this technology. Uh, Captain Bill Uhlhaus, uh U.S. Marine, retired. Uh, he died just recently. Uh, Marine uh, Corps, a fighter pilot, worked at Wright Pat. Uh, I don't think any flying disc simulators went into operation until the early 60s, around 62, 63. He actually worked on these simulators, which simulated the anti-gravity craft. Simulator they used for extraterrestrial craft, they had 
the 30 meter one that crashed in Kingman, Arizona back in the early 50s. We operated with six large capacitors charged with a million volts each. So there were six million volts of those capacitors. Think T. Townsend Brown and what he was saying uh, in the early 50s. So we developed a lot of this stuff uh, on our own uh, with a little bit of help from the ET in terms of crash vehicles. And then he mentions that they built uh, a number of these over the past 40 years. He also noted, interestingly enough, one of the craft he worked on was a controlled craft the ATs, or aliens, wanted to present to our government, the USA. So there was some, uh, as somebody mentioned yesterday, there was some technology transfer uh, going on uh, in the early 50s. Uh, a lot of that uh, went, went sour as the U.S. covert groups took all of this stuff deep, 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 deep black and for their own uh, war agenda, etc. Mark McCandlish, whose drawing has been shown here uh, in a colorized version. This is Mark McCandlish at the National Press Club in the Disclosure Project in May uh, 9, uh, 2001. Uh, a close friend, as you heard yesterday, a close friend of his, Brad Soros, and also an illustrator, told him of visiting the big hangar at, uh, hangar at Norton Air Base in November 12, 1988. There were three flying saucers floating off the floor, no cable suspending them the ceiling, from the ceiling, no landing gear, and just floating, hum, hum, uh, hovering above the floor. The smallest was somewhat bell-shaped. They were identical in shape and proportion, except there were three sizes, 24 to 60 feet in diameter, obviously man-made, looking a little tired, he noted. And they had a little exhibit there with a videotape running showing the smallest of the vehicles sitting out in the desert and later on uh, taking off into space in the, in the video. It showed this vehicle making three little quick hopping motions, then it accelerated straight up and out of sight, completely disappearing from view in just a couple seconds. No sound, sonic boom, nothing. Well, the craft was called what's now known, is used the term quite universally now in ARV, Alien Reproduction Vehicle, also nicknamed the flux liner. Uh, the voltages in the system, half a million to a million volts of electricity. Again, think back to Towns and Brown's original proposal back in the early 50s that if you had this, uh, you could do very, very well. Brad Sorensen stated that the ARV uh, display, uh, at this display, a three-star general said that these vehicles were capable of doing light speed or better. Here's this drawing, his original drawing uh, that was in the Disclosure Project uh, documents. Uh, it's available in many other places today, uh, showing the large capacitors uh, down around the bottom here. Uh, these are the, the capacitors. Uh, uh, there's some batteries back in case you can't see them in this particular drawing. Uh, he actually noted that you could start it up with a few marine batteries, 12 volt marine batteries, pretty slick. Uh, part of the central area on that dealt with um, uh, the energy generation technology, the pilots uh, sat, uh, sat here, here, and there was uh, video cameras outside so they could see out, uh, if you will. Lieutenant, a little documentation that comes along, and, and uh, the nice thing about the disclosure project is that we talked to multiple witnesses who would cooperate, who didn't know each other and cooperate other information. For example, Lieutenant Colonel John Williams here pictured uh, was an Air Force uh, 64 rescue pilot, Vietnam, etc. He noted to us there was one facility at Norton Air Base that was close home, meaning that nobody knew what was going on, not even the wing commander uh, knew what was going on there, rumored that there were UFOs there. Uh, his father related to him, uh, John Williams' father related to John, is that uh, during a dinner party around that time, a very close friend, a RAND employee, keep that in mind, uh, was invited. After several drinks, this RAND official said that the government was spending more money on anti-gravity than any other project in the history of this country. Think all those aircraft companies in the early 50s who said, snicker, snicker, you don't do anti-gravity, and they were doing it. It went deep black in the late 50s and been there ever since. So today we have uh, TR-3Bs. Here's somebody's, somebody's idea of one. I put some big question marks there so you don't uh, you know, question me. Uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to the web, just do a search on TR-3Bs and more advanced, a large uh, triangular craft uh, owned by and run by uh, black projects, uh, if you will, and seen by people all around the world. Uh, now, this is a, a, a great little uh, tidbit here. 
Um, Jan Harzan, our very own Orange County John Harzan, uh, was meeting with uh, Ben Rich in a, in a group, in a lecture, 93. And many of you have heard this story, uh, but Ben Rich noted to Jan that we already have the technology to take ET home. Uh, Tom Keller in his book uh, has put uh, a detailed discussion of this, I'll mention that in a minute. In a private conversation, uh, Harzan and Rich uh, asked Rich how it, a UFO propulsion, works. Rich, Ben Rich replied, let me ask you, how does ESP uh, work? Harzan, way to go, Jan, uh, answered, all points in time and space are connected. Harzan answered that. Rich said, replied, that's how it works. A new concept? No. Uh, Schrodinger, in 1927, noted that uh, is how things work, and we'll come back to his quote uh, in a few minutes here. This is uh, Tom Keller's uh, book, which is out there in a stand. You can get it. It's uh, excellent, uh, up-to-date, uh, within the last year or so, a review of a lot of uh, major incidents in the UFOlogy world. Uh, he's done a lot of research, uh, talked to a lot of people, and he's really put together a, a nice book on it. Nice work, Tom. Okay, so we get to the question that many people ask, and not this crowd so much, uh, because you're pretty uh, much in the know on things uh, due to these conferences and what have you. But, uh, boy, the general public just doesn't get it at all. Why, if we had this question, I get asked all the time, why, if we have this technology, aren't we using it for the betterment of the world? Uh, good question. We'll see, uh, as we discuss this a bit further, and you probably know the answer to this, we'll see the UFO, ET secrecy, and the multi-trillion dollar transportation and energy sector, energy sector secrecy are closely related. And that's really what it's about. So we'll talk about energy first and we'll come back to that uh, business. And I, I want to go to my friend, uh, many friend people know Tom, Tom Bearden, brilliant man who's uh, studied uh, energy, energy technologies for many, many years, had written uh, umpteen papers uh, he was one of our uh, witnesses for the Senate briefing I put together at the behest of my uh, senator back in 2002. Uh, he was one of the witnesses I uh, had there talking about this, as was Paul uh, from yesterday, Paul, Dr. Labella. Uh, Bearden notes that all electromagnetic energy comes freely from the seething virtual state vacuum uh, via a proven broken symmetry of the source dipole. Big heavy words here. Uh, but if you put a negative charge and a uh, positive charge, you separate these things in space, uh, so to speak, you'll get a flow of energy that is created by the separation of these charge. Uh, this means that, as you see here, if one can set up a charged pair, positive, negative, separate them to make a dipole and maintain the separation, then real, observable, usable electromagnetic energy will flow from the quantum vacuum state uh, until the source dipole is broken. In a little diagram there uh, showing this thing, and he goes into this thing in what might, one might term excruciating detail in his 900-ish uh, page book, uh, Beard and Energy from the Vacuum Concepts and Principles. Uh, restoring, I might add, the original equations of James Maxwell, uh, which were purged of their zero-point energy stuff uh, back in the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, here's what happened. In 1892, Lorenz removed the possibility of free energy source from Maxwell's equations uh, from 1865, which described electromagnetic theory and produced a set of uh, electromagnetic equations known today as the heaviside Lorentz equations. These have been used by scientists and engineers since about 1902-34 in that time period. Basically, four generations of engineers, scientists, have used a subset of the original Maxwell equations. The subset has had been excised of the free energy terms. So our present-day electromagnetic systems continually break the dipole so they can require more energy, water, coal, oil, nuclear, et cetera, to start the energy flow again. The trick is to catch the energy 
and separately dissipate its load without destroying that dipole and then the energy will flow. Uh, where does this electromagnetic energy come from? A little picture of Paul Dirac there. Uh, energy has been called by a number of scientists and re researchers. Cold energy, scalar wave energy, energy from the vacuum, zero point field energy, dark or negative energy, longitudinal energy, radiant energy, etc. All of this refer to energy that comes from <clears throat> the vacuum that we're talking about there and can be ultimately converted into electromagnetic energy that can be used to run things. In 1934, Paul Dirac described a way to extract this energy by inducing a negative energy, negative probability in the local vacuum of a specific region. Cool. One simply introduces a sharp little boop, low energy perturbation with a sharp gradient, sharp gradients. Uh, the pulses pop electrons out from the direct C. Um, cool. So he talked about how this could be done in 34. There are many, many technologies that have done this. Most are very hard to work with, actually. Tom Bearden lists, uh, I don't know, over 30 in this long list. I'm not going to read it to you with this long list of technologies that are examples of overunity or technologies that extract energy from the quantum vacuum state to run something or do something in an energy-wise uh, situation. Now, this is a, a, a side and a side, and um, I'm pointing this out to people because I've gotten this information from somebody in the Pentagon uh, whom I know who has uh, let me have this information. I don't know quite what to do with this, so I'm just going to put it out there and let you kind of chew on it. If anybody has information that can uh, elucidate uh, put some light on dark energy, I would appreciate it. Here's the situation, uh, and I'm sort of quasi-quoting this friend of mine. Some feel that longitudinal or dark energy is the source of energy that drives advanced zero-point energy devices. In other words, for example, magnets, magnets appear to get their energy by extracting energy from this dark energy, longitudinal energy. Now, this dark longitudinal, I'll call it longitudinal, let's make, save time here, can be captured with nonlinear electronic circuits and converted into usable energy such as heat, electricity, or propulsion. So you can devise, sorry, not normal circuits, but you can devise circuits that will extract or, or, uh, this energy and convert it into usable energy. It then can be indirectly measured. So if you have something to produce heat, you can produce, given a situation, the amount of heat it produces. At the present, this is the interesting, that it is decreasing rapidly. In other words, they're measuring this thing. They've been measuring for three years. I'll show you the curve in a second. And it's been hypothesized by people studying this that the Earth's electromagnetic field will start to decline and become unstable. As this begins to happen, changes in both the strength and the direction of the Earth's magnetic field will become apparent at some point to even careful, casual observers. At some point, the Earth's magnetic field would collapse, leading to increased solar radi radiation followed by a magnetic pole shift. So this is a stretch. It's a step, a step, a step. But if we look at the curve that they produce, and this, uh, the electronics for this are developed by somebody who worked in uh, covert black projects for a number of years and has uh, put these circuits together to measure this longitudinal energy density. Since 2008, uh, the terms here are relative uh, on, the, uh, on the axis over there. The y-axis is just relative numbers intensity, if you will, uh, was around values of 90, but decreasing, as you can see, uh, right in this area, is decreasing. They had trouble with their equipment, which uh, broke down. They had to repair a bunch of stuff. Uh, during that time period, they got it back on. Uh, back in the early uh, 2010, and since there, you can see it's been dropping so that it's dropped from 90 units down to 20 to 30 units over the past three years. Uh, this is data as of July 21st, which is relatively recent. Uh, the data from yesterday uh, it falls in that same uh, little blob right here, so it's sitting here. Now, the, uh, the curve uh, is a pretty uh, statistically significant curve, so at this point, mostly because data are part apart. They're watching this very closely. The, uh, the demise of this system, if it uh, works, is somewhere around early next year. Uh, you're, 
wobbling that back that point there at the very end to see where it actually hits. Whether or not the there's a relationship between this uh, dark energy, longitudinal energy, and Earth's magnetic field, and whether the Earth magnetic field variations that we're seeing presently are a result of this or something else, or a, a major a wave front, as uh, Paul talked about yesterday, uh, with explosions in the center of our uh, galaxy and, and moving out. Don't know. Don't know how that relates, if it does. Anyway, if anybody has any information on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, the website is down there, P-S-C-I-N-E-T, blogspot.com. You can go look at this curve yourself. He updates it once a week and follow what's happening. Okay, so let's see what's behind, back to the story here, what's behind UFO energy and secrecy. The what are the evidence for UFO ETs as complex but manageable. We've all heard that. I won't go into it in any kind of detail here. You've all heard it. The how or the nature of secret programs is difficult, complex, and I love the term Byzantine. Uh, these, these secret programs are kept secret by not keeping them a secret or by confusing the whole thing, as we all know. But the why, the reasons behind the secrecy is the most challenging problem of all. And I think we all understand what that is. Basically, those in control like to stay in control. They are very risk adverse. A lot of them have been involved in this thing for uh, hundreds, uh, not hundreds, but 40, 50 years. Don't want to change the way they're doing things. Um, do not want to give up control and power easily. The inescapable fact is the disclosure of ET presence would bring with it a certain release of technologies. We've talked about some of these over the last two days. That, were released, that release would sweep away the entire technological infrastructure of the planet. It wouldn't happen overnight, but it would happen ultimately. The changes would be immense and sudden. Sudden depends on how fast this will be allowed to happen. In part, I talked about the very beginning. Consider these changes. No need for oil, gas, coal, nuclear power plants, internal combustion engine, no pollution. Can't happen fast enough. Technologies using electrogravitic devices allowing for above surface transportation. We have those. No more roadways that cover fertile farmland since transportation could take place totally above the surface. The impact of this change is both good and bad news, depending on which seat you're sitting in out here in the audience. And uh, we'll stay tuned on that. The next topic that I want to get into is uh, communication. And this is kind of the fun thing. Uh, that ETs communicate with us in many, many ways. Wikipedia is doing its very best to uh, keep the people in the farm uh, out of the knowledge uh, loop as uh, their article on superluminal faster than speed of light communication states, because such communication is considered by science to be impossible, most articles in this category are from the works of fiction. And then they go on to uh, have a few works of fiction, and that's Wikipedia on superluminal communication. Yet, there have been multiple scientific papers on the subject which they totally ignore. And yet, also, it does not make sense that any advanced civilization visiting our solar system and planet Earth would be able to not be able to communicate with their home planet in something approaching real time. And I don't have to go through the hello, wait four years for an answer, hello back. Schrodinger, as I mentioned earlier, stated here, and this is why, ETs can communicate almost instantaneously. Advanced use of the mind and consciousness for superluminal communication is the way ETs communicate. They have to. After all, Edward Schrodinger noted in 1927, multiplicity is only apparent. In truth, there is only one mind. Quantum physics thus reveals a basic oneness of the universe. Remote viewing takes advantage of this, as we heard for the excellent talk yesterday. Uh, by Jove, uh, accessing this one mind, this picture of Hal Putoff up there, who uh, Putoff and Tar, we all know that story. Uh, accessing this one mind helps explain the reports to remote viewers who can essentially view objects at great distances in real time, as Joe noted yesterday. How does it work? Uh, there's an excellent uh, talk by Hal Putoff in 2008 who noted that in his best assessment of how it works is, I don't have a clue. That's a direct quote. <laughs> I said, whoa, wait a minute. You know, here's the guy who sort of invented this thing and sort of the SRI and the whole publicity to it and sort of fed into that all that research that he says, I don't have a clue. Although he noted in his talk that it might involve multi-dimensional, additional dimensions or some sort of quantum entanglement. 
So say that fast three times, and you'll understand what it is. Here's uh, Joe's talk yesterday. We've heard about his experiences and his uh, views on ETs and uh, future viewing and uh, some of the technology the ETs has. Uh, good book. Another book that's rather interesting because it sheds some insight on some of these issues is the book by Dan Sherman. Anybody read that here? Probably can't even see anybody. Uh, his, little, uh, his little book called uh, Above Black. Uh, Dan Sherman was trained as an intuitive communicator by the Air Force in the early 1960s, uh, or, or excuse me, in the 80s, but he, he was started in the early 60s with genetic manipulation of embryos, of which Dan felt he was one. Uh, and then when he joined the Air Force, uh, he was involved in uh, sitting at terminals, using his mind to communicate with the terminals, and recording many series of, of numbers which he duly reported. The more, I thought the more interesting point was the following. He published in 98 his book called Above Black, and um, as he did this more and more, which, which he found was very boring and annoying, uh, he decided that he would try sort of working his mind a little bit differently. And, but further experience over uh, several years that he did this allowed him to form, communicate on a higher plane, whatever that is, allowing him to form questions, receive answers, and receive visual images other than just the, the string of numbers that he was re, re, reporting uh, earlier on. The ETs noted that with surprise, they had not expected humans to communicate on this higher plane. A clue to what the ETs can do, and a clue to the potential future for humans, as was discussed by Jim uh, last night. Anybody read this book? Yeah, very interesting. The Use of the Mind for ET Observation, Ingo Swan. It was, uh, he did the work, and then he was not allowed to talk about it for 10 years, and he published the book. Uh, what was it, 90, late 90s, I guess. Uh, it's about UFOs, about the nature of mind, and about the moon. And if you haven't bought your copy, you can still get one on Amazon for $350. Uh, I, I believe this would be called, let's buy up all the books this guy wrote because there's too much real information in it, and only somebody who's desperate, there are a few copies still floating around in people's libraries, uh, but they, they won't cause any trouble. Uh, amazing book, if you do get a chance to get a copy of it. I have a friend who looks at used book sales for me for, for books. He comes with boxes of UFO books. I said, there's a standing order, find one of these. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Recently, just to tell you that things are still active or, or people are still talking about this, uh, in Edge Science, published just a couple days ago, uh, Paul Smith, who was uh, actively in charge of some of the remote viewing programs, has written, re written this, uh, an article on remote viewing and, excuse me, a state of the field in edge science. Uh, you can get it in a book stand uh, coming down the pike. ET communications continued. So it's possible to access the mind consciousness field through the advance of technology as well as the mind itself. Uh, Dr. Greer mentioned in his, early, his first book, Talking to a Witness, uh, who had described to me, he worked in Bell Labs, uh, is a Bell Lab scientist, uh, described what he termed a consciousness-assisted technology, or CAT. In the early 1960s, a scientist was given an ET communication device the size of a grapefruit to study and to reverse engineer. The device mentally communicated with the scientist that the scientist should destroy the device since those who wished it reproduced had malice in their hearts, and he did so. I think they wanted to dry it out in the oven and the oven got too hot, something like that. Uh, <laughs> oh, whoops, who turned up the heat? Um, anyway, but there is a, a, a device that's conscious and can make decisions and uh, kind of um, decisions there. Now let's talk about everybody's picking on SETI, so I thought I'd hop in here on the bandwagon. Uh, does it appear that SETI is searching for the right place for evidence? No, they are not. I underlined that. Uh, no, they are not. Radio signals are too slow for interstellar peoples. They're limited by the speed of light. SETI looking for radio signals is like the native people looking for smoke signals in a modern city as evidence of people while everyone is running around with cell phones. Um, 
I think that kind of says it in a nutshell. My, my favorite, I guess I got time to tell this real quickly. My favorite story about SETI was a personal story uh, in interacting with uh, Dr. Jill Tarter, who was uh, one of the heads of the SETI. A number of years ago at, at, at Harvard uh, University, it's, uh, it's our East Coast, uh, Stanford. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she was there giving a lecture to the, uh, in the astronomy department at Harvard and uh, talking all about their uh, gazillion channel receivers and all the rest of that, computers and all the rest of it. And um, at, I had been, uh, just the, the prior year, this is in 99, I think, I, a, a year and a half or two years before that, I had been at the closed congressional briefing in Washington, D.C. Uh, that CSETI had put on at the behest of our governor. I was appointed by her, uh, in fact, she's our senator now, uh, Senator Jean Shaheen. And she'd asked me to go there and represent the governor at this closed congressional briefing. And Edgar Mitchell was there and, and a whole bunch of other people, witnesses. Um, so after Jill Tarter's talk, I stood up after a few questions and I said, uh, I'm Dr. Loader for the University of New Hampshire, the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space, blah, blah, blah. And I just attended a briefing in Washington, D.C. Uh, with a number of military witness, uh, mil witnesses, government witnesses, pilots, uh, talking about the reality with the government documents of uh, UFOs, ETs, uh, on the surface of the planet. I said, don't you think it would be worthwhile to have C SETI, or SETI, excuse me, uh, have SETI spend some time uh, looking down here, you know, maybe 10% of their budget looking on Earth instead of up there. And she looked at a reasonable question, I thought, uh, and she looked at me and said, there's absolutely no evidence that uh, UFOs are real. Next question. <laughs> Just like that. Now, the analysis that I thought about this after, after it happened was the following. There's only two explanations for this, and each one are damning. Let me go through them very quickly. One, she knows that the ETs, are visiting the planet down here. But she doesn't want to do that because she's, somebody's telling her to look up there. In other words, she lied to me. And she lied to the whole audience. She lies to the public about that. So the damning thing is that what the heck is she doing being the head of SETI program uh, if she doesn't know about what's going on here on the planet? So, you know, she's damned both ways. And so if she does, so that's, if she doesn't know about it, what is she doing being ahead? If she does know about it, why is she lying? Either way, uh, either way you can't win on that one. Well, I've been a member of CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, many of you have uh, heard or read about it over the years. Uh, I've attended, uh, we've, we've had or run uh, probably 100 CSETI trainings over the last almost 20 years and have observed multiple ways in which the ETs communicate with us on the ground. The senior SETI, uh, SETI team has compiled their observations and experiences in an entire book. We sat down and basically dictated this book three or four years, three or years ago, I can't remember, in 09, uh, covering our amazing uh, experiences with ET communication. And I'm going to go through uh, some of those modalities with you just uh, to give you some sense of uh, what we do. Uh, here we are setting up in a, uh, for some field work in the evening. This happens to be in, uh, uh, this one is, uh, uh, I guess I have to show this. This is out in uh, Crestone, Colorado. Uh, also Crestone, Colorado. This is up in Mount Shasta. And uh, this is setting up in the evening for a long four or five hour time in the field. We use uh, laser, uh, green laser pointers to point out objects in the sky uh, to let people kind of know what's uh, going on. Uh, here uh, we are setting up. So the first aspect of communication is actually taking photographs of stuff that may be out there or not. Uh, this is a picture of uh, yours truly with the bad hair day. Uh, uh, setting up my tripod, which I'm going to put my uh, nice little uh, telescope on uh, for looking at things. And right behind the arrow points to it there, you can see the arrow pointing down is a craft. Uh, this is the blow up of it, uh, the craft sitting right there. Well, that's kind of cool. Uh, Raven uh, uh, Nabolsky uh, from Orange County actually took that picture. She also took one in uh, Charlottesville, North uh, Charlottesville, uh, 
Virginia, where we had a training uh, a year or so later. And uh, same sort of thing, there's a craft uh, as we were setting up uh, this evening. So very often, we'll have craft uh, as we're setting up. We, people try to keep their eyes on the sky uh, while we're setting things up. So communication just by showing up. Uh, we found that communication occurs uh, not in many, many modes. There's mind communication. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Sight, we just talked about seeing things out there. Feeling, uh, the, uh, the hair standing up in your arms, you know, the pilo erection, uh, whatever it is. Uh, feelings, hearing, touch, smell, all of these take part. The ETs communicate in many, many different ways. It's not just, hello, I'm uh, Zixoc from the planet so-and-so. The state of the mind and the level of the consciousness of the individuals involved in this plays a critical role in the success of communication. Uh, I have four little examples here. Uh, on uh, Mount Blanca in 99, uh, 1999, there was a group of us up in Mount Blanca in the evening, late evening. Uh, we'd go into a circle. We were sort of in a, in a contact event type of thing. Uh, there were ETs uh, on the ground around us. I could not see them. Some people could. A friend standing right beside me is standing beside and said, Ted, Ted, can you see them? They're right over there. They're just the little guys, and they're so loving. They're just about this high, and they're kind of scampering about. They sort of come up and go back, come up and go back. And I'm, all, I'm, all I'm seeing is sort of gray, fuzzy, lit areas. I couldn't, see, I couldn't resolve with my eyes of the individuals. So I, I, I said to this uh, woman later on, I said, you know, you really ought to talk to Dr. Greer about it, uh, because after that, I had talked to him individually, and I said, uh, what did you see? And he said, well, there's some very tall beings there, and there's some very short ones that are kind of, they're kind of shy, and they kind of run around. So I later told uh, this woman, I said, go talk to him and tell him what you saw. So both of them saw exactly the same thing. Interesting, they were the only two, and I got independently from them. They hadn't talked to each other. They had told me both the same thing. And yet they were the only two in that group of 25 or 30 that saw anything that last night at that re resolution, if you will. So the ETs can come there. They can be in sort of an altered state, a shifted uh, into the more astral form, if you will, a shifted form. This is done through technology, in part, and consciousness. Um, Mount Shasta event was during a meditation. We were all in a meditation, and Al, Al Dunaway, uh, who uh, is a very, very good remote viewer, among other things, spent 20 years doing Snoopy stuff on uh, U.S. submarines. Uh, but Al was there. He had his eyes closed. And he got a message while his eyes were closed, look up. It was as clear as that, he said. Look up. He opened his eyes up, and there was a triangular set of stars, lights, shall we say, moving across the top of the group, right in the zenith. We, we videotaped it. It was seen up in, this is Mount Shasta, Northern California. It was seen up and down the coast hundreds of miles. Other people saw it and reported it as well, so it wasn't just wackos in the field. Um, and it was a direct communication look up to his mind. Everybody who was awake saw it there. There was a couple people sound asleep. That happens. Um, uh, let's see. The next one is the England, oh, the Joshua Tree. In Joshua Tree in... Um, 2009, we had a very interesting uh, event happen, which I'll describe when I play the sounds for you uh, in a minute. Uh, we, we often have radar detectors in the field. The ETs interact with us through the radar detectors, and I'll, I'll play some of that in a minute. Uh, the England crop circle communication, uh, which is the next thing, was this uh, crop circle uh, produced in... 1992 in Alton Barnes. It is the shape of the C-SETI logo, which all of you have seen at some time. Here's the, the lower picture there, uh, right here, is the actual thing in the field in Alton Barnes. Here's some of the, the, uh, the straw or hay, or whatever the, the grains were, sort of laid down uh, in a sort of a, a woven uh, pattern there. The history behind this is rather interesting, and it's one of several that have had this experience. This crop circle appeared the night after, or the night uh, of earlier on that evening, Dr. Greer and the team that was over there at that time had sat down, made some drawings on a piece of paper, and decided they were going to ask the crop circle makers to make something in this shape. 
It was only the small group of them. They wrote it on a piece of paper. They sort of drew it out and they said, okay, everybody in the group said, we're going to consciously project this image to the crop circle makers and ask them to make the circle or to make the, the, the formation. The next day, there it is. So there's a linkage between, and, and uh, Colin Andrews has talked about this uh, in his writings, and he's had that experience too, as uh, Bussy Taylor and others of the crop circle uh, people have had this experience where there's a connection between the crop circle makers and the, crop, and the, the, the croppies or the people who are studying this thing. So there's a consciousness connection. And of course, as Linda pointed out, with some more complex ones, it really gets neat. One of the phenomena that we see constantly when we're in the field are uh, what we call flash bulbs in the sky. And uh, this, uh, this picture over here on the left-hand side of your screen here, uh, this happens to be Dr. Greer. He's standing up there. He is just, I, is actually in a video, but I, I have the stills here. Uh, there, as you can see, there are three stars right there, three stars right there. There are the three stars right there, and right in that area right there, this brilliant flashbulb-like uh, magnitude, minus four or five or whatever else, choo, flashes out at us. And he was flashing his laser at that area of the sky, choo, flash back at us. Um, so they're communicating back, yes, uh, we see you, we know where you are, um, hi. Um, pretty cool. And this has happened literally hundreds of times. I remember in Joshua Free and, and Shasta one time, there was a group of craft up in the sky to the, uh, no, 20 degrees up across the sky. Four or five of these craft were flashing at us like that, just off and on for an hour. And the star field moved by. It was cool. I mean, the, the, the stars moved by, so they were staying at the same place in the sky, even though the Earth was rotating. Same place relative to us. They were not setting if you will. Uh, that's in the distance. We call those flash bulbs. We, again, as I said, we see them again and again and again. Uh, in Charlottesville, a number of years ago, we had one of those that it flashed at us every 11 seconds for an hour. And it sat there, the star field moved by. So, is it a stationary satellite? Anybody, you, you, all you, all you, um, all you um, California space scientists that are here, who work on satellites. Do we have satellites, if you could answer this question for me publicly, probably I'd love it. Do we have satellites that sit up there in stationary orbit, because it sat at the same location for an hour as the star field moved by and just flashed every 11 seconds at us? And if it's up in stationary or orbit, that is one hell of a flash if you think of how far out stationary orbit is. <laughs> That's, that's more than your average uh, camera flash, I think. Uh, we also have a lot of communications in terms of flashes of light that are right in the group, within the group, over our heads sometimes. We've had flashes just poof, illuminate the whole circle. And uh, also in the trees around it, this is, uh, you can see this little uh, streak going by this tree. It's in front of the tree. The tree was you know, 150 feet away from the group. Uh, or so, it wasn't up in the sky. Uh, there are also times when we see flashes. Uh, here's one. This, this appears and disappears, this little uh, set of three, within a, about a second, about one second. So it's on three or uh, five or six or ten frames of the video, just poof, like this, and disappears. Here's the same area right here, literally second layer or so, and it's gone. Here's another one of those uh, three, three flasher jobs up in Mount Blanc in 2009. So we have these happen all around us, and with video night vision scopes, uh, we can pick these things up. Sometimes we, they're bright enough to see with visually. We also have orbs. This is an infrared uh, photo taken, uh, infrared camera, infrared flash, uh, and there's the group sitting around, and there's an orb right above that in that little triangle. There's the perfectly nice, nice round orb sitting above us. That particular picture, just one. We also, uh, here's uh, infrared, this time it's, it's sort of reddish because I left the color on in the infrared camera. And uh, here's a, two pictures taken 10 seconds apart on the outer banks here, one in which we have a number of orbs. And they often seem to move around. They often are sort of streaked. So they, there's a, this round thing that's sort of streaking out. And then, then the lower right uh, hand corner, it's gone. It's gone. 
Okay, another interesting thing happened to a woman in Australia, a C-SETI member, and this is kind of cool. Uh, she was uh, sitting around in the evening, and her dog was outside, and he went outside and ran down to the beach and was sort of barking at the water. Now, she said her dog, Skipper, as you can see, Skipper never went into the sea. He was scared of the water. When we put him in sand puddles, he ran the other way. What kind of dog is this? Uh, this particular night, he walked into the sea as if on remote control for about eight to nine feet. We had to go in the cold water and get him out. She said she was sort of moved to take a picture. Now, it was dark. She couldn't see a thing. Nothing was out there. She had a camera with flash on it. It was dark on the beach, and she took this one picture. The picture is on the left here, and it, the, uh, there's some orbs or dots or splashes. You can see the city of uh, uh, Adelaide in the distance there. And there was this brilliant white thing within the, within the picture. It just overwhelmed it. When we photoshopped it down, sort of closed down the, the brightness of it all, this object was inside that, or that was the, the craft that was inside it that had been communicating with her to come on out and communicating with the dog. So animals can sense this. Again, communications. This is kind of cool. This happened uh, in uh, Virginia. Uh, we can see that you can see the group uh, sitting here. This is Dr. Uh, Dr. Greer, uh, Dr. John Bravo, and myself in my telescope behind my head there. We're all sitting there. There's a fellow across the, the circle from us with infrared Sony night vision camera. Uh, it was on Sony night vision, and he was just photographing the group. And this object came into the group, and you can see it picked it up in one frame. Don't know what it is. Uh, we assumed it was an ET communication probe of some sort. Obviously, pardon? Well, we could call it that. It was there for one frame. And actually, actually, if you follow the video, Dr. Greer actually was, had sensed something coming out of the sky, coming down. You can see his head going like this. Uh, it wasn't a moth, because we've seen those as well. Now, I've talked about sounds as well, uh, and I'm going to play a couple sounds for you because sound is another modality that is used by ETs to communicate with us. And see if this works. This is the crop circle tones. Oops, how do I do this here? Un Can you turn up the sound from the computer? Oh, there it comes, okay. This is the... I don't know if I can turn it. Could you turn it up a bit? I feel like I'm talking to the space here. <laughs> right, thanks. These are uh, tones uh, slowed down. The initial one was that sort of sound uh, recorded by Colin Andrews in a crop circle in England uh, back in 91. And they were taken by uh, a fellow who's a musician who works with us and then listen to very carefully and then synthesize, he reproduced them exactly and this is what uh, the sounds were, were like. We often play these sounds using radio transmitters back up because they are ET and we figure that uh, they can listen to these things and hear them. Uh, the next one I want to play are radar detectors. Now we'll have radar detectors under a number of people's chairs in the field Different radar detectors. Okay, I'm going to shut, shut that up for a second and, and, and tell, tell a little bit about this because this is rather an important event in a sense. Uh, we'd been out in the field for about four or five hours. It was about quarter of one in the morning. We were in the process of getting our gear to go home. It was uh, Joshua Tree a few years ago. Cold, you know what Joshua Tree is like. Total cloudless sky, stunning. And uh, we'd have a few, we'd seen some things during the evening, what have you. Uh, when several, we, we were getting up, it would all of a sudden, the radar detectors, uh, which had been basically pretty quiet during the night, we're sitting out in the middle of Joshua Tree on Geology Tour Road, if anybody knows where that is, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and no traffic, nothing, quarter of one in the morning. All of a sudden, the radar detectors start going nuts all around us. And uh, everybody stopped what they were doing, stood perfectly still, and for 15 minutes, the radar detectors were going, dee -dee 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 -dee. and what you hear 
is there, it's, it's not like the normal, the police are at you with a gun thing. Uh, they they kind of talking to you, and they're different radar detectors sort of in this audio dance of information being transmitted. We call them the Orion transmissions. They were actually a lot of information was coded, uh, we, at least we've been told that people have analyzed this uh, within those. So I'll stop it, go back, I'll stop it right there and, and say the following. After that occurred, we were all standing around saying, oh my God, what was that about? And Dr. Greer had, had noted that they're coming from Orion, meaning they're coming from the sector where the Orion constellation was. So we were folding up our gear after this was over and said, wow, that was pretty cool. And I took my laser pointer and I flashed it at Orion. Just flash, flash, flash. Um, I won't do it here, but anyway, because we can't see Orion. Flashed at Orion and they flashed back. Three or four times over a couple minutes, I would shine my laser pointer, and then several of us got our laser pointed and said, hey, we're here. And we flashed, and they flashed back at us, sort of a, as a confirmation with us that they were communicating back with us. Uh, we've also been using recent years the little magnetometers, the tri-field natural uh, uh, magnetometers, and we find that magnetometers are just measuring the magnetic field around us, and when the ETs are on the ground around us, or there's a ship in the area, it will affect the magnetometer and the magnetometer response. Everybody's sitting perfectly still in their seats, and all of a sudden, the magnetometer starts squeaking. In other words, they're responding to fluxes in the magnetic field right around us, in spite of the fact that everybody is sitting still in the middle of nowhere. So the ETs are using... Uh, okay. Sounds like a bunch of chickens. Um, okay, we will go through quickly uh, to finish up here. Crop circles are obviously, I won't go into them, uh, but they've been, uh, they're obviously a means of communicating something. I think all of us are still trying to work on that and a lot of other scientists are. A couple, uh, those are just a couple of the really spectacular uh, detailed ones, including the one right across from, uh, yeah. Uh, these are recent ones, 2011. This is one that was started at the bottom, uh, started at the top, and finished the next day at the bottom. So that's a new, a new. Uh, very few of those are done in pieces. These are six or seven pointed stars. It looks like uh, they are, are showing lunar calendar here, uh, all around this uh, this uh, pointed star here. This occurred in Italy, interestingly enough, not just in England. So we're learning a lot from the ETs, but it's going to take a deeper understanding of the nature of mind, the consciousness, and the reality of the universe to sort of get it all together, which will not come well to the entrenched scientific establishment. I want to spend, a, I just have a few more minutes here, so I'm going to sort of speed up here. Uh, Buzz Aldrin has mentioned on CNN, C-SPAN, excuse me, the existence of uh, something on Mars, uh, Mars moon, that is, of uh, the uh, towers, here, is this a community ETs communicating with us, or is it a relic for something that they were doing? There actually is more than one monolith. There's one uh, nearby, the big monolith, which you saw pictures of uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, I, I can't remember who showed us those. And the monolith, the big one, is about 107 seven meters. That's 300 some feet tall. So it's a fairly large object, uh, artist rendition of what it might look like. Another interesting thing is, uh, were the ETs communicating with us? when the comet Shoemaker-Levy collided with Jupiter, causing the massive holes or, or collision spots in Jupiter exactly 25 years from the initial Apollo landing. Here's Eugene Shoemaker and David Levy. And the, um, the data on that are as follows. Uh, the first fragment was July uh, 16th. The Apollo launched July 16th. Uh, and then the last fragment, July 22nd, Apollo was on its way home. So some people said to the exact minute, the data that I found didn't say exact minute, so I'll just leave that with you. Were the ETs telling us, look what we can do? Don't know. The last couple minutes here, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, our secretary of, uh, what is she? State, State right. Uh, dealing with other countries is walking with Lawrence Rockefeller carrying a book of Paul Davies' book, Are We Alone? In the 1990s when she had been briefed on the UFO stuff by Project Starlight. 
Views of cosmology are rather interesting. It's interesting that some religious people and others in the earlier part of the 20th century made such statements as God created the universe as a basis for higher forms of consciousness. We'd like to think that. Served by a multiplicity of inhabited worlds. Edgar Mil Edward Milne says, if a single plant were the soul of his activity, he could sparsely find opportunities to enjoy himself. Pretty forward thinking. We now have the neo-Darwinists and uh, other people. The course of evolution does not follow predictable trends. It's purely random. The blind watchmaker concept of Richard Dawkins and what have you. And really the dire view of some scientists, such as Jacques Monod, stating the ancient covenant is in pieces. Man at last knows that he is alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe, out of which he has emerged only by chance. Neither his destiny nor his duty has, have been written down. Ugh. Stephen Weisen Weinberg is even worse. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. Well, <laughs> we might as well jump off the bridge. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sorry, these guys are going to have a shock at some point. Unlike Rupert Sheldrake, who is putting together the sort of science of observations that Joe Mondegal uh, pointed out yesterday of the connectedness to us all and why ETs from planets out there look like humans. Morphic resonance fields, if anybody's read his work. Final thought, thought question here. And this comes out of the concept of emergent properties in consciousness. If it's possible to build a machine that's conscious, as reported by multiple sources, including uh, Linda this morning perhaps, what does it tell us about the nature of the human mind, which is conscious, at least most of the time, the spiritual nature of humans and their ET counterparts? Is consciousness an emergent property, one that arises in a physical system, reaching a, once it reaches a complex level, a level of complexity? It would have to be organized complexity. Uh, we make very complex things and they don't, they aren't uh, conscious at all, such as Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> finally, uh, not finally, but a couple slides there left. Uh, Paul Davies is a cosmology thinker about consciousness and what have you, and states that consciousness is a fundamental emergent property in nature. In other words, a system that is set up to do it can do it, whether it's innate or, or inert, or either it's a human or in a conscious living things. In other words, consciousness happens. I think we need a bumper sticker. Uh, everybody has saying consciousness happens. Thank you, Paul. Uh, there, have been, there will be an amazing advances in medical sciences. We've heard about some of those uh, from uh, Jim last night. I won't go into those uh, very much uh, outside. I have personally talked to people who have in a meditative state have had lights surrounding them, uh, a, a box sort of glowing, sort of passed around this woman, cured of breast cancer, which she had just found out a couple weeks before that. Went back to the doctor, gone. Longer lifespans, we've already talked about that. Humans are doing research on uh, telomere lengths under uh, electromagnetic forms, fields, so we're working on that. These are the introduction why there'll be speed of changes. We won't go through those again. Uh, just a couple summary comments here. We estimate today about three quarters or more of the people in the covert world support disclosure. Uh, we think amnesty is probably needed for that to happen. Uh, we predict that there will be major social, economic, global upheavals until Earth's people settle into a new peaceful paradigm, including new energy technologies, a peaceful interaction support from the ETs, and a rise of the collective consciousness on Earth's people. How ARP Albert Art, Halton Arp noted, we are certainly not at the end of science. Most probably we're just at the beginning. There will be no going back. Ultimately, this will be a very good thing for the human race as we take our place among the races among, of intelligent beings in the universe. We will ultimately become ETs ourselves. What we're hearing is the future ETs are coming back. We already will have become that ourselves as we travel to other star systems and take our place with other peoples from the stars. Here are some of the talks. Finally, uh, sec uh, thirdly, uh, the acceptance of contactee reports 
on what they've observed and what they were told. We heard a Jim Sparks talk last night, uh, which is excellent, informative, very interesting, and yet many uh, contactees like himself who talk about this are poo-pooed in the uh, media and the, and the press and government spokespersons. Finally, uh, finally uh, the issue in terms of the speed of changes will depend upon, the, depend upon the rate at which entrenched human organizations, and boy, they are entrenched, and governments incorporate this new information into human society and, of course, how human society responds to this new information. So, although I can tell you today or the, and CNN can talk about today, here it is, this is what's happening, it's going to take a while for these changes to be uh, accepted. We can expect there will be major resistance to any changes, especially from the global money sectors and the control groups who keep this under wraps. This because they do not want to change the present paradigm, which is basically uh, raping the earth uh, for all of its uh, information, uh, natural resources, what have you. Any of the many technologies potentially available will be considered disruptive technologies and disruptive technologies are those uh, which are transformational. Here's a little history of... Disruptive technology, a little uh, list I put together in three categories, warfare, transportation, in energy sources, the colored ones at the bottom are those that are sort of in the future, now and in the future. The others are fine. So we start out with just example with warfare. Everybody started out with warfare using fists and rocks initially, and then we went to spears and arrows, and then we got uh, gunpowder and guns, and, and of course that expend, extended to planes. And then once we had planes, we could then drop bombs and bigger bangs and atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, nuclear bombs, rockets, a different way.
I was involved uh, heavily in the disclosure project, which kind of really uh, set the stage for this back in the uh, early 2000s uh, in Washington, D.C. I co-wrote the briefing document uh, with Dr. Greer on this thing, which is still almost a 500-page document you can get uh, from our disclosure project website. Uh, Early on, we heard a talk about after disclosure, AD. I'm going to term, define the term open disclosure, and I mean that the following. Governments of the world and the media totally accept and publicly discuss the reality of ETs visiting our planet in an honest and open manner with the public. This has not happened yet, as we all know. Uh, particularly when anybody, uh, there are uh, the media, members of the media who will talk about a sighting or something going on, and they always either preface it with little green men or go snicker, snicker, and green cheese at the end of the year. We've all seen that on everything from CNN, to ABC, to NBC, et cetera. So until they totally accept and publicly discuss the reality, open disclosure has not occurred. So what I'm going to be talking about in this talk is the concept of where we go once open disclosure occurs. There will be dramatic and rapid changes in many areas of human endeavors on this planet. These changes will result from the sharing of information by and from the ETs, as well as the release of knowledge gained by covert human project. Linda just gave us a perfect example of a covert project dealing with ET uh, and, and t knowledge and technology. The speed of these changes, and I'll get more into the changes as we go on, will depend on at least four factors. And I'll come back to the end of the, at the end of the talk on these four factors. One, the willingness of the ETs to share knowledge in the rate at which they share. They will determine how much they tell us and at what speed they tell us, uh, basically for our own good, I believe. Second of all, the willingness of human covert groups to share what they have already learned and have kept suppressed for many, 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 many decades. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I, somebody said, you can't see anything from up here. So I, I can't see anything from up here. It says spotlights. Interesting place to be. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have some uh, fun here and look at some different things dealing with uh, different aspects of post-contact technology advancements. And here's, here's my little title here, uh, ET Contact, Implications for Post-Contact Advancements in Science and Technology. So with that, uh, excuse me for the mic, uh, we will start here. Uh, this, uh, actually all of us speakers, which nobody has mentioned to this point, all of us speakers uh, wrote a paper uh, for this conference. Uh, and the papers, this is what mine is, mine looks like, the, just the abstract, I'll read it to you. You can get it somewhere, uh, someday. I don't know where they are uh, so far as the black hole, but I think they're going to emerge and everybody, you'll get uh, availability of those things. Let me start off right off at the very beginning. Uh, in the introduction section here and say, without, uh, without argument, intelligent beings from other star systems have been and are visiting our planet Earth. They are visiting Earth now. Anybody with an IQ over room temperature <laughs> who does a little bit of homework comes to that conclusion. It doesn't take much. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. This is not a matter of conjecture or wishful thinking. Now, so that's said. We will use the term, I will use the term ET, extraterrestrial, in this discussion, indicating that the beings that we're dealing with, communicating with, learning from, are not generally from Earth. One could go into other arguments that they've been here for a long time, underground, and all that sort of thing. I'm just going to use that as a general term, and I think all of us are familiar with that term. Uh, from the movie on. The second uh, definition I want to define for you is the concept of uh, disclosure.